Welcome to Cape Breton Movers and Shakers, where we talk with people who are doing interesting things here in Cape Breton Island. I'm Richard Lorway, president of GoCapeBreton.com, and with me today is Wesley Colford, executive director of the Highland Arts Theater in beautiful downtown Sydney. Welcome, Wesley. Hello, Richard. So lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Nice to talk to you again after this week, you know. <laughs> yeah, we we I'm, I'm privileged we get to talk somewhat regularly. As yeah, exactly. Our, well, well, I, I am on the board, so just so yeah. viewers know that uh, you know I, I am familiar with uh, the HAD and its operations. Yes. Yeah. So you know, James Brown used to be called the hardest working man in show business, but I had, I have a sneaking suspicion you're a contender. <laughs> <laughs> I go through fewer towels though, but uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, producing, directing, appearing on stage, managing all that. You know, how's it going? That's we'll start there. Yeah, I mean, if if um, if theater folk weren't the hardest working people in general before the pandemic, we certainly are now, and and it's been a, a rough year to say the least, but uh, but one in which we've been able to continue operating at least in a fashion, and that's been a a, a pretty major miracle on our end. Um, not just thanks to my efforts, but our our staff, our actors, uh, our audience members, ultimately, so many people have put in so much more work than even at usual um for you know at times a fraction of the payoff and uh it's just a testament i think to that sort of spirit of resilience and innovation that uh the arts community and, and theater in particular really embodies so um it's certainly not been easy it's it, i mean it never was easy and i think maybe that's part of what has positioned us to be able to adapt um but we're very lucky especially being cape breton that, that we've had such a you know re relatively few cases over the course of the last year and a half and even with the, all of the restrictions that we still have in place, at least there's a whisper of normality, which I know, I mean, I have lots of peers across the country where that's not been the case this entire time. So, right. So it's complicated. You, the hat has managed to mostly stay open, right? And yeah, and, other than obviously. when we were sort of in complete shutdown. Yeah, right. Exactly. So it's one of the few, if not the only one in Nova Scotia that's kind of stayed open throughout. Um, we were the, the first and only professional theater for most of the last year and in Nova Scotia. And, and I would say even across the country, there's very few other theaters. So again, right. we're very lucky. So, so since we're talking about, um, in COVID a bit here, let's, let's briefly chat about how we managed to do that. We meaning you. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, again, being radical sort of access, what I'm talking about. let's yeah, let's, exactly. Like, that's how did that thing. come we, about? So um, we knew a year ago or thereabouts that uh, things were going to be rough. We knew we'd probably be allowed to open to some degree, but we were looking at, you know, maybe 50 people in the audience in a 400 seat venue. So it doesn't take a mathematician to recognize that even though the audiences were, were very small, all of our costs remain the same. We have to pay our actors. We have to pay for the lights, we have to pay for the heat or the air conditioning, electricity, all these things. So um, in order to balance that equation, uh, I came up with what seems like very not intuitive answer that to, to make more money, we would make all our shows free. And uh, the way that worked was we were able to leverage our, our status as a charity to encourage people to make monthly donations. Um, as, uh, you know, sort of starting goal, we said we needed 2000 people from across Cape Breton and the world to commit to $25 a month. And that would facilitate about 50% of our overall costs, which was the minimum we needed to ensure we could pay all of our bills, pay for performances and programming. And as a result, because that funding wasn't coming from ticket sales, which previously had been our, our main source, if not our only source, um, it, it meant that we could make those shows free of charge. So the incentive was people that previously had been buying tickets now could pay less than they previously were, get a tax receipt, meaning they would get some of that money back uh, on their taxes. Um, and then also people that maybe don't care about theater themselves would hopefully recognize the importance of this in our community. The fact that we were able to offer this with no financial barriers and hundreds, if not thousands of people from across the island have now been able to participate and experience live theater in a pandemic and free of charge. So, um, needless to say, it was, it was a smash success. I, even I, and I was very hopeful, but I was shocked by how quickly people really bought into this new concept. Um, we've had a huge amount of support from the island, but also from, again, ar around the country and around 
North America. Um, we had some really great press in the Globe and Mail, uh, in the New York Times that, that sort of got the, the word out. And now we live stream all of our performances for free as well, which has resulted in hundreds and thousands of people, again, getting to see our work that otherwise would have never been exposed to it. So it's really put us on the map. I think it's it's yet another way that Cape Breton has been put on the map, which we're always very proud to, to be ambassadors for. Um, and not just because of our work, but sort of the, the, the idea and the model of, of being radically accessible. Um, I've, I've talked to many other theaters and you know, a few national conferences about the concept. I hope it's something that we'll be able to continue and I hope it's something that will catch on. Right, right. Yeah. So how long has the hat been in operation now? This would have just been our seventh year, our eighth summer, which is wild to think of because we started in 2014. Quite a ride. So so yeah. going back to the beginning, how did it all get started? Sure. So I always I have to credit my father, Kevin Colford, who was the original uh, the, the inspiration and uh, it, it was his brainchild, really. I, I heard whispers, I think, the Christmas before that he he'd heard that, you know, the beautiful former St. Andrew's Church uh, was unfortunately going to be closing and was, you know, very real risk of being torn down. And he started musing about this idea of turning it into a performance venue, which, of course, it had been previously for Celtic Colors and, you know, various uh, organizations as well as being a church. Yeah. So I thought he was, uh, you know, more than a little bit daft. Um, I, you know, it's a, a beautiful building, but very, very old, needed a lot of work. And, uh, you know, as anyone will tell you, uh, theater is about the worst way that you can make any sort of financial in, in investment or endeavor. Um, but he started kind of like owning a, the concept. a football team or a hockey team. It's, it's expensive. Well, to yeah, <laughs> yeah. Often, you know, sometimes <laughs> not, but often. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I was, I, I always say I was incredibly skeptical and I was living in Toronto at the time. I, I certainly, I grew up here, um, but had been in Toronto for about eight years and loved the idea of, of a performance venue downtown, loved the idea of being able to come home occasionally and do work uh, in the field that I'd been trained in, but I did not have any expectation it would be as successful as it was. So I, I got involved the first summer um, I was asked to come and direct the very first show called The Bukowski Brothers, which I'd written and had been happening in Ontario around that time. So it made sense. It was about the the sort of golden age of vaudeville in Cape Breton and, and on Charlotte Street. So uh, it made a lot of sense as the first show. Um, yeah, absolutely. I thought, great, you know, come for a few weeks and get to see people and go to some beaches. And I was so blown away by the support and, and encouragement by the whole community that pretty much right away I knew there was something special going on and at that point I was I had a few gigs in, in Toronto I had to go back for but I, I committed to coming back to do our very first production of A Christmas Carol that fall that success blew Wachowski Brothers out of the water any you know any expectation I had at that point was just quadrupled easily the the community rallied behind us so quickly and so with such enthusiasm um that again I thought okay this okay something's going on here and I kind of conspired and agreed to then stay and, and facilitate five theatrical productions over the first five months of the next year. And that was our very first season with a, sort of a ticket package where we said, we'll get five shows for $50. A lot of them were brand new plays by Cape Breton playwrights, certainly plays by people that, you know, even if they're from known in Canada, they wouldn't have been known here. Uh, Heart of Steel was sort of our big smash hit of that season. And we were so like that, that again was such a success, like these successes just kept compounding um, to the point that I think it was, it was near the beginning in that, in that 2015, we said, if we could do a season where we could get just a thousand people to get ticket packages, we could actually have a bit of a budget. We could actually pay everyone. We could know that we have some amount of revenue to, to, you know, not just throw this all completely together with shoestrings and laces. Um, and we thought maybe in, 10 years, maybe we could get a thousand people to get these ticket packages, maybe. And less than a year later, we had over a thousand people. And that's just the kind of exponential growth that we had. So I was I was wooed pretty fiercely by the community. I mean, I think that's that's why I stayed and that's why I'm still here ultimately. And and you know, things like radical access have really proven that that this is an organization and an institution that matters. It's not just artists getting together to, you know, pose existential questions in a vacuum. This is actually a very tangible 
um, and, and meaningful impact to a huge portion of this community. I mean, in 2019, before all of the limitations of COVID, um, I believe, I think it was 37,000 people came through the door. And, you know, for reference, this is a community of about 100,000. So uh, that's not insignificant. And, you know, a lot, a big portion of that is from our theatrical pres presentations. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of concerts, we have dance performances, we have you know, magic shows, comedy, all, you know, all, all kinds of things. Um, and things that really didn't have a venue, at least in Sydney, um, prior to us. So we're, you know, we're very fortunate, but it, it is all because of the community. So that in, in the right. dark days, that, that makes it worth it. Yeah. So, you know, I've been a long time resident of Sydney. And, and I think, you know, not that I'm visionary or anything, but I, 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 I did, I, I realized and I saw the hat having a significant impact on the downtown, a downtown that had kind of become you know, tired. Yeah. Like, yeah. Heard, you know, when I was growing up, the Rotary shows, of course, were huge. They yeah. were huge. I mean, they had parades down Main Street yes. and they and people dignitaries yeah. came in and opening yeah. night was kind of like black tie and it was reported on the radio. And I mean, those were kind of the glory years <laughs> for the Rotary show. And sure. then um, and then we and of course, we had two movie houses downtown and that. So there wasn't a lot driving t traffic downtown. And I think the hat is changing that and so do you have any comment on and, and roger brooks mentioned in a report that he yeah talked about you know we need things in in our downtown cores wherever they are that bring yeah. people to the downtown at least 200 nights a year yeah so that that's i i quote that story all the time because when he came uh, i think it was actually uh, he did a lecture at the hat ironically yes and, and and said that and um i think it was actually i think it was sort of for like a thriving downtown i think it was 150 nights of programming in a year right. and in that year this was a couple years ago uh i think we had like 160. um and ironically with covid now that like with, with the numbers per night decreased it was over 200 in the last year so right uh you know single-handedly we're more than meeting that quota and i mean i mean we're not the only ones obviously there's so many exciting new uh businesses and restaurants and, and endeavors um that i think i'll build on each other because every time you know if we get 400 people coming to the hat probably a quarter of them at least are going to get a meal after another quarter might get drinks afterwards right. um, people go shopping when they pick up their tickets people come to our classes at the hat academy and while their their kids or while their parents are taking classes they go shopping downtown like there's there's so much spinoff um and it, it i think it's again it's what what a downtown needs there's there's a, a communal gathering which again sadly we've, we've all been lacking for the last year and a half um but that's what I think we we have the great privilege to provide for a lot of people, and and it, I mean that's certainly how I feel connected. Um, yeah. So, it's, so it's do you special. think like having um, an arts and entertainment district, if you will, is that that's certainly one strategy that will make a community healthier? Definitely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, just any. I mean, this is sort of the this has been the downfall of downtown and in, in Sydney is you know for year most of my lifetime. 90% of the businesses will close at five o'clock and anyone who works, of course, that has no reason to ever come downtown. So having a robust night nightlife, for lack of a better word, um, I think is definitely important. Um, I think there's huge opportunities and huge possibilities, uh, especially, you know, as we get closer and closer to normal. Um, but, you know, but there's lots of, you know, like things like the Center for Craft and Design and, and the, the Convent Project. And like, there's a lot of, of really exciting things within the arts and, uh, not to mention music. I mean, how many places in Canada can you go? And at most restaurants, you can hear a live musician doing often original music, uh, you know, at a very high level. Um, like we take those things for granted. I think. I think we yes. uh, yeah. we're, we're kind of spoiled in Cape Breton. There's so much talent, and <laughs> yeah. nobody really values themselves as much. There's some way so. take an issue with that statement, but anyway, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, musically, perhaps. yeah, I think, I think, yeah, 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 yeah. It's tough. It's 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 a uh, it's a bit odd. I feel. I feel like. Um, I mean, this is not just a Cape Breton problem, but in Nova Scotia in general, we're so quick in our promotional material to, you know, have the the person fiddling on a hill and bagpipes and in Celtic dancing or you know any number of artistic practices when we're trying to attract people. Um, but then when you're here, it's very difficult to get support for for the for the culture se uh, sector, and it is a sector. I mean, it's a, it's an enormous 
contribution to the GDP. I mean, our, our efforts alone are hugely significant and almost all of our revenue is poured back into the community, back into downtown. So I think people forget that it's, it's you know, there's such a holistic and, and sort of soulful necessity that, that our work uh, breeds. People don't always realize it's it's a major economic driver as well. And, and again, not just for us, but then all of the other peripheral businesses that are impacted, um, as well as everyone in, you know, we're, we're paying actors who get to do something that they're they're passionate, they're trained, uh, they're you know they they have a calling for, um, but then they're also getting paid, and then they're they're also going to go back in the community, spend that money again, and uh, and you know and multiplies from there. So gotcha. there's a lot that people don't consider, I think. So you made a reference to the Hat Academy. Yes. So, yeah. So the Hat Academy is is obviously where you it's an initiative of the Hat where you train the next generation of artists and. Yeah. And in some cases, older artists as, as well. <laughs> yeah, but I think um, so. There's there's two aspects. One one is you have to build a talent base so you can put on high quality project productions yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. The other aspect of it is there was probably all kinds of people who had who aspired to the stage, but didn't have a way to exercise those aspirations. Can you talk about that a little bit? A hundred percent. No, that's very astute because I think um, I mean when I started, you know, there was this sort of uh, small but mighty, uh, uh, I guess, community or, or delegation of, of actors that had worked at the Savoy or the Boardmore or the Banshell Players at the time. Um, but, you know, pretty, pretty uh, inclusive in a way. And, and that was one of the things when, like that was the one success of our first Christmas Carol was we wanted to do this big show and, and feature people from all ages and all backgrounds and all disciplines. Um, and so from the beginning, nurturing that that new talent or aspirational talent uh, is a big part of what I love and I think a big part of our success. So we realized we, you know, we needed something more slightly more formalized in order to give people experience if they were interested. Uh, and again, like you said, from all ages, I mean, our classes now go from age five to we say 105, basically, as, as, as old as people are interested, we want to see them, whether they've done it all their life or whether it's the first time taking a class. Um, and, you know, so many of our great performers of the time had their hat debut or sorry, had their stage debut at the hat. Um, you know, these weren't I mean, we, we benefited from the experience of all the other institutions that were before us, of course. But so many of my favorite performers just came to an audition or came to a class um, and we saw something or they they had that spark that's sort of indefinable. Um, and I think that's so important. I mean, uh, from every aspect. And, and I always say. The, the kids that are growing up who, you know, when we started maybe I think five or six years ago was our first sort of uh, like education outreach program. And so there's kids that were 10 then that are now 15 or 16 and they are so talented, but they also have just such a wealth of experience. So they have the discipline, they understand the ropes, they pick things up so quickly. Um, and that's something that I certainly didn't have to that level, even when I was their age um, and, and very few people I think have. so we're getting to a point where there's this critical mass of talent where I, I imagine it's frustrating because when you're when you're 12 or 13, there's not always a whole lot of roles that you're appropriate for, but we're getting very close to that breaking point where suddenly there's gonna be about 40, 16 to 18 year olds, and they're just gonna sweep the stages. And uh, I, I can't wait to see that happen because they're already, I mean, shows we've done like Frozen or Susicle or, or uh, we just had to Alice in Wonderland in June. It's astounding how talented they are. Um, and they're just going to keep getting better. So that's that's very exciting for me to see that. Instead of searching for leading men, you're going to have a, a plethora of leading men. You'll have too many leading men. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. And, and for years, just finding anyone that wasn't white or Scottish or Irish was very difficult. And, you know, partially because of, of changing demographics across the island. But we're seeing now this insurgent of young talent from all backgrounds, all nationalities, all colors of skin, and and you know every identity, and that is so exciting because, again, it it's it's cool to see us catching up with more maybe metropolitan parts of the country where uh, it's not just the assumption that everyone is going to be white. We actually have this tremendous wealth of talent to draw from, and and we're not having to seek it out. It's naturally organically growing and growing and becoming more normalized, which is so, so great to see. All right. So what do you see for the future? Anything, you know, coming down the pipe? Well, that is the big question. Um, you know, we still it's have, about, is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen with provincial restrictions for the fall. We've got probably 30 projects that we wish we could do, many of which were plans from 2020 that have been postponed. Um, at this point, we're, we're playing things relatively cautious. We, you know, I think if we can get through the fall and if we can get through the Christmas season, that's going to be a really big victory. So I don't want to overcommit until we just get a better sense of, you know, what what COVID and, and future closures may have in mind for us. But but we're you know we're ready and poised, and if things look good, we, we're going to pull the trigger on a whole lot. We've just sort of had to made a soft announcement of a fall season which will include hopefully the return of our full scale Christmas Carol, maybe with a full audience by, by December. So um, that's kind of what we're hoping. Uh, there's certainly all kinds of projects that I, I want to say more about, but I'm gonna hold my tongue. Uh, I'm not sure when this will air, but we have our, our second HAT Radical Access Telethon on September 19th. And part of that is gonna be uh, quite a bit more teasing about some of the big projects we're excited about. So. Um, some of that will depend on the success of that campaign and whether donations continue and if, if we're able to raise more support. Um, but regardless, there's going to be a lot of really cool things. And as long as people keep coming, we'll keep doing what we can and making magic. Super. So here's a question we've been asking people, um, you know, putting them on the spot a little bit, I guess. But if you, if you had one piece of advice for people with theatrical dreams, if you will. Hmm. What might it be? Um, I would say the same thing. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna widen that lens a little bit because I, I think it's it's great. But I think uh, I mean lots of people don't have theatrical dreams. I think this is still good advice. Oh well, general advice um, is good. Yeah. Any yeah. What, so whatever your dream is, whether it's theatrical or otherwise, um, I think you have to do it. I think that's uh, that's certainly been our success. Um, I I I have a lot of ideas. I I, I like to plan. I like to have you know 20 different versions of things but at the end of the day any success we've had is because we said this is the first step and this is the poster and this is the date and no matter what happens it's going to happen we have to we have to be ready for that people are buying tickets and uh you commit to it basically you commit to it yeah and and you know there's you know there's a lot that you learn i think you you have to take those risks and dare to fail is, is one of my sort of mottos always um uh, but, you know, as much as you need to be prepared and you need to do research and you need to, you know, do everything you can to anticipate whatever might go wrong, at the end of the day, if you don't make that commitment, if you don't step up, it never will happen. And something, even if it's not fully realized, is always better than nothing, in my opinion. And it only means the next step will be that much more closer to being fully realized or, or further along. So um, I say do it. Figure out, figure out what it is. Be smart about it. Be prepared to work hard but make that first step, whether that's, in, you know, going to an audition or writing a play or putting on a play or starting a business or going to school or anything. Uh, I think I think that's what Cape Breton needs. I think we're getting a lot of it. I think this is like a, a sort of renaissance in terms of uh, Cape Breton opportunities and innovation. Um, and I think that's why like the people that are doing that get that, I think. Um, but I think it's an attitude we all need to have. We can't wait. We can't expect someone else to fix the things that we don't like. If if we see a vacuum, we need to fill it. And amen, uh, amen. amen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know you know that. <laughs> yeah, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> I know, I know. But if there's any movers and shakers listening out there, start moving and shaking. This is start our, moving and shaking. Time. All right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, Keep James thanks Brown. For yeah, <laughs> your time today. And for Thank you, Richard. Uh, that was Wesley Colford, Executive Director of the Highland Arts Theatre in Sydney, Nova Scotia. We'll see you next time on Cape Breton Movers and Shakers.